Uh, good morning, church family. It's such an honor to be teaching God's Word. Dr. Graham, thank you for that introduction. It's such a privilege to celebrate being here a year, and I want to tell you, this is the greatest church in the world, ladies and gentlemen. So it had the opportunity to preach here, to believe with you. When people ask me, what's it like uh, being at Prestonwood, do you know what I always tell them? I say, you know what, I have grown in the Lord so much under Dr. Graham's ministry the last year. I've grown in the grace and knowledge of Christ. It's so good to look back and see, wow, those spiritual mile markers along the way. And so it's a special honor for me to teach God's Word and learn along with you all this morning. I would encourage you to take your Bible and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're in the midst of a series called Tell Me the Story of Jesus. And this is a fun passage today because we see how Paul, who is the author of our passage, not in the Gospels, wants to make sure that he gets the story of Jesus right. I hope that you have received an outline. It was so cool. Uh, before the last, or at the end of the last service, uh, people were taking lots of these home with them saying, Jeremiah, I'm going to go do this uh, Bible study with, with my life group now. So feel free to take extras if you like. Um, we're going to fill in the blanks together. But I've given you a, a cross-reference of Galatians 1, 18 and 19 as well. So let's hear what God's Word has to say to us this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the most important passage on the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus and on our own resurrection in Christ in the entire Bible. This is, this is a summit passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, now I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, and according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried. Make sure you don't miss that. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and now Christianity does something that no other religion can do. Paul says, now test me in this. Look at verse 5. He gives us what's called the appearance tradition of Jesus. And he appears to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, many of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. I love the appearance to James. We'll finish off the sermon with that appearance today. And then last of all, he appears to Paul. If Jesus physically rose from the grave... Christianity is true. It's game, set, match, ladies and gentlemen. If Jesus rose from the grave, we can trust what the Bible says. Everything that the Bible says rests on the truth of a historical event that is conveyed in the Gospels that Jesus died by a Roman crucifixion, he was buried, and he rose again. Why is this message so important, this message of us understanding why a resurrection-centric faith is absolutely important. Because Paul tells us right there in the Scriptures in verse 3, what we're studying this morning is not second place, it's not third place, it is a matter of first importance. In other words, we got to get this right. And that's okay. We, so we need to level up our understanding of the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. And unlike any other belief systems in the world, Christianity says that you can test us against history. If what we say we believe about Jesus and his resurrection is true, it should have a fallout all over the world and all over archaeology. There should be evidences of it. And I'm delighted to tell you that there is incredible evidence for the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. And friends, this morning I'm going to take you by the hand and I'm going to take you through what I'm calling the seven best reasons to believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus and why that matters today. Why a resurrection-focused faith will energize us. Why a resurrection-focused faith is the key to our ethics. It's the key to our joy. It's the key to us being strong in the face of great adversity. It's, the, it's truly a sermon and a message that you need and we need and we need to be reminded of it. That's why the Apostle Paul says, now brothers and sisters, I wanna remind you of the gospel. Do you know why he says that? It's so easy for us to forget the power of the gospel. Have you noticed that? 
It's so easy to get complacent. And so Paul comes along and he says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preach to you, that you have believed in, and then he reminds us of the keys of the gospel. Now, I want you to know that every time the gospel is presented in the New Testament, there's always three things mentioned, the deity, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the deity, the death, and the resurrection. If you've got the deity, the death, and the resurrection, you've got the gospel. And Paul says, don't mess it up, don't add to it, don't add works to it, don't add religiosity to it, it's the gospel, Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and his deity. What's so interesting about this passage is it's the earliest passage that we have that even predates the gospels on the resurrection of Jesus. But Paul, when you think about Paul, Paul met Jesus as the resurrection, Everyone else in the appearance tradition that we've just read, they knew Jesus before he was crucified and risen from the dead, right? Paul met him as the resurrection. Think about what a profound impact and experience that would have been for Saul of Tarsus. But I still find it interesting, even though Paul has this great experience with God, who all could say, Jesus appeared to me on the road to Damascus. Paul still went to the local church to make sure he had his gospel right. I find that fascinating. He wasn't too smart. His experience didn't make him better than anyone else. And in the corresponding passage in Galatians chapter 1 and 2, and Dr. Graham, I hope we can time travel in heaven someday because I want to go back to Galatians 1 and 2 because Paul says, even though I've had this great experience with the Lord, I went to Jerusalem for 15 days. Talk about a vacation, a spiritual retreat. And who does Paul meet with for 15 days to hear the story of Jesus? He meets with Peter. He meets with James. And then he goes back a second time, couldn't get enough of making sure he gets the gospel right, and he meets with John. So there you have the four biggest names that launched Christianity, Peter, James, John, and the Apostle Paul at the same place. They want to make sure they get the gospel right. And today, I want to make sure we have the gospel right because a resurrection-centric faith is the key to having hope in spite of all of life's difficulties. You know, I don't know what you're dealing with today, but I'm going to teach you this morning, according to the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus, why we can have hope, and listen to me, in the face of the most dire and difficult obstacles. The resurrection shows us that we can have hope hope, we can have faith. In fact, in this chapter, if we had time to, it would take a while to go through it, but at the very end of this chapter, verse 58, Paul says when you really get the resurrection, when you start to understand the truths of Jesus' resurrection and your resurrection, guess what he says? Therefore, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that everything you do for God matters, not just for today, but for all eternity. That's a power pack verse, isn't it? So this morning, would you self-describe your walk of faith as strong, as immovable? Are you always abounding in the work of the Lord? Well, the cool thing about studying the resurrection is it focuses us on the majors. We get out of the minors and we get in the majors and we get serious about the gospel and about spreading this great message to our communities. There are 300 verses in the New Testament that teach the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is our first fill in the blank. If you're watching or taking notes, and I'm thankful for our uh, online team as well that have made these notes available to you. So thank you for joining us online as well. Dr. Graham, as public theologian and as our pastor, has set the example of biblical worldview, a Christian worldview, a worldview that engages our hearts and our minds, it influences our decisions. It influences our priorities. We've talked about biblical worldview in the past. And we need to make sure that we understand what the center point is of a Christian worldview, and that is the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The center of a Christian worldview is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all emanates from this singular fact and truth. The other remarkable factor that's immediately practical and encouraging is I love quantifying the promises of God's Word, and I love putting them in categories. Do you know that, I mentioned a moment ago, I think there's 260 chapters in the New Testament, so when you have 300 verses on the resurrection, you immediately see its importance. 
But when you actually categorize the promises of God to us, it's fascinating to me that the promise we're given as followers of Jesus more than any other promise in the New Testament is the promise of John 14, 19. Do you remember Bible thinkers, what John 14, 19 says? Because he, Jesus, lives, you will live also. And that promise is repeated 24 times in the New Testament. So this morning as we learn about the power of Jesus' resurrection, you're learning about your own resurrection. Your own resurrection is linked with Jesus' resurrection. You see why this this overwhelmed the church to such an extent that the resurrection event became even more popular to talk about than even the teachings of Jesus and his dominical tradition from his own lips. It catapulted this, this ragtag group of believers to being world changers. And as historians, we scratch our head and we say, what would have motivated them to literally take this message to the ends of the earth? if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and surely he did, and that's the motivation. So let me, let me take you by the hand this morning. I have a hundred evidences, historically speaking, that point to the greatest probability that Jesus physically rose from the grave. But I boiled those evidences down into seven proofs. These are the proofs that I teach my children. These are the proofs that I would talk to you about if we were having coffee. And then we could immediately see that there's immediate pastoral and practical applications within these seven proofs. Let's look at them together. Why do I believe Jesus physically, bodily rose from the grave? Number one, the resurrection of Jesus is the only, and I mean the only way that we can make sense of the suffering in our world. I have sat with Christians that had the peace of God, and they should not have the peace of God because of the experiences they've had, but they chose to believe in the promises of God, and so they were hope-filled instead of hopeless. I've sat with inspirational men and women who, in spite of all the odds, the resurrection gave them hope to live another day and to even have an abundant life. I think about my little sister, Jenny Lee, who had a stillborn baby at age 25, uh, 25 weeks, stillborn baby. His name is Wesley. And the beauty and the power of the resurrection, and Jenny was never, my little sister was never far from my mind as I was writing this book because she was hurting. She'll never be the same with the loss of their son, Wesley. And I just thought with every page that the Lord allowed me to write, how would this page minister to Jenny Lee and Jeff and Savannah and Sadie with the loss of their brother, Wesley? And then I was directed to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When he says that we grieve, but we don't grieve like those without hope, we grieve with hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. And then he goes, comfort one another with these words. You know, it's amazing when we have loved ones, perhaps you're approaching the next two weeks at Easter, and maybe you've lost a loved one. Our hearts go out to you as a church family. Perhaps that this is the first Easter you've had without a loved one or a special friend in your life. The beauty of the resurrection is we can still talk about our loved ones in the present tense. We can talk about them because they're more alive today in Christ than they've ever been before. They wouldn't come back even if they could. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, to be absent from the body is to be what? Say it with me, present with the Lord. And that presence is face-to-face communion with the Lord. I could do the entire message off this, Romans 8, 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth the glory that will be revealed to us. Ephesians 2, 7 is another passage where Paul says the resurrection is actually a continuum. A lot of us see resurrection as the end game. The resurrection is the start of the race, ladies and gentlemen, because Paul says in Ephesians 2, 7, God in Christ is going to show us more grace in the ages to come. Can you imagine that? Now, I've needed a lot of grace in this age. How about you? And evidently, he's going to show me even more grace. I'm going to go to graduate school in the resurrection someday, and I'm going to see even more truth about God's grace to me in Christ. I love it. I love this teaching. It fires me up. It gives me hope. Number two, Jesus called it. Did you know, just like Babe Ruth called his shot when he hit a home run, Jesus called his shot too? On the third day is the hashtag of the early church. Did you know the early church had a hashtag, on the third day? And as I often say, we cannot help you as a church if you don't know what a hashtag is at this point, friends. (laughs) Jesus 
had this really unique way, and this is why we teach the whole counsel of God's Word. We follow our pastor's example. We teach the inerrant Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Why is the Old Testament just as important as the New Testament? Because we would not understand the significance of Jesus' ministry if we unhitch the New Testament from the Old. In fact, Jesus has this amazing way of taking his Bible in the day, which was the Old Testament, and he would pick off different pas passages and he would say, hey, that's me. He would apply them to himself. I call it messianizing different passages. One of Jesus' favorite passages in the Old Testament is Hosea 6, verse 2 and 3, and I put it in your outline. It says, after two days he will revive us, and then notice what it says next, on the third day he will raise us up that we may live before him. Do you know skeptics come along and they say, oh, Jesus, he didn't know what his mission was. You know, he was a nice guy, a good rabbi. I think he might have given us the golden rule, but you know, he didn't really know he was God. He didn't really want to go to the cross. That took him by surprise. In fact, people who came later made him God. I mean, this is what's being taught at many universities today in Bible courses. Well, what does the actual evidence show us? Jesus knew what his mission was, to save you and me from our sins. Look at Mark 8, 31, Mark 9, 31, Mark 10, 33, and 34. These are passages we should have on the tip of our tongue because Jesus makes it clear, the Son of Man, and remember, you might want to jot this down, Son of Man is his favorite self-description. It appears 69 times in Matthew, Mark, and Luke alone. 69 times he referred to himself as Son of Man because if you and I were in the audience, that would make us think of Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man sits at the Ancient of Days, right hand. He is God. He is the Messiah. We knew what Jesus was saying of himself. And not only does he quote essentially Daniel 7, but in the same passage, we see Hosea 6 too. Look at that. He predicts his violent death and resurrection. He, I'm going to be killed. And then look at this. After three days, rise again. After three days, he will rise. And after three days, he will rise. Do you think Jesus was confused about what his mission was on earth? He knew exactly what he was doing. Don't ever let a skeptic try and tell you that the body of Jesus would have been lost. They would have lost the wrong, you know, Jesus' body would have been gone to the wrong address at the tomb. Don't ever believe that. I want to show you a, past, a beautiful photo of the western side of the Mount of Olives, looking into, isn't this a beautiful photo, into the eastern gate or the golden gate of Jerusalem. Of course, you, if you know the prophecy of Zechariah, Jesus and his second coming will step foot on the Mount of Olives. He will process through, and we with him in the resurrection, uh, through the Golden Gate. You can see that Suleiman the Great under the Muslims actually walled up the Golden Gate. They buried Muslims in front of it. Uh, they're aware of even this prophecy. But back to the Mount of Olives, look at those bone boxes. Do you see those little boxes? Those are bone boxes. Why am I taking a minute to explain this? Because if we don't understand Jewish burial traditions, we're not going to be able to understand how to defend the resurrection. In Judaism, let me tell you something, the family that was buried together stayed together. You did not lose track of your loved one's body, even if they were criminals, as we'll see in a few minutes. Do you know there's around 150,000 bodies buried at the Mount of Olives? I love how this photo shows this to you. Even the Jews are buried. Notice that the boxes are all facing towards the eastern gate. Now, I don't dance, thank God, but I can explain what they believe they'll do in the resurrection. They don't even want to have to turn around. Literally, they're pointing, they, they're risen from the dead, and they walk straight through the eastern gate. It's kind of cool. Burial is a huge deal in Judaism. They would not have lost track of the body of Jesus it was a sacred duty and a sacred honor. Number three, why do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Jesus demonstrated, he adumbrated resurrection power. Not only does he predict his death and resurrection, he shows in Mark chapter 5 he can raise others from the dead. That's Jairus' daughter. Luke chapter 7, the widow of Nain's son rise from the dead. And then I love John chapter 11, the resurrection story of Lazarus. I think about that passage often when I have the opportunity to minister to someone who's in crisis because in John 11, both Mary and Martha, they must have had a huddle before Jesus showed up because they both look at Jesus at different times and they said, you know, Lord, if you had just been here, this wouldn't have happened. 
If you would have just been here, this wouldn't have happened. And yet, Jesus, that's when he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, he asks. And then, let's check out the image. Jesus looks over at the, at the tomb. That would be Lazarus' tomb in Bethany. This is a two-side picture here. It's the only place in the Gospels we read that Jesus shouts, other than the cry on the cross. And he shouts at death, and if we were there that day, it may have sounded something like this. Lazarus, duro exo, come out. Now, it's quite hilarious, actually. A lot of Bible commentators and thinkers think that if Jesus wouldn't have said the name Lazarus, everyone who's dead would have come out of the grave at that moment. It's kind of fun to think about. Lazarus, though, would die like the widow of Nain's son and like Jairus' daughter a second time because Jesus and his resurrection is what Paul says the first fruits of resurrection to have an undiable body, a body that will never die. What's really cool about Lazarus is he's actually buried in a, a second place. Just think about that for a moment. A second burial spot. This is on the island of Cyprus. I don't think death was a big deal to Lazarus the second time around. Do you? I've been there, done that. I'm living for the resurrection. It doesn't need to be a big deal to us either. I love this. Number four, Jesus's resurrection, make no mistake, was not what his disciples, or any other Jews for that matter, anticipated. We can look, and I would highly encourage you, as Pastor said, to get to the land of Israel on his tours. Because you, the Bible, those of you who have just been to Israel, these things are just clicking with you right now. I heard that after the first service. Get there if you can. You might stop and see the Dead Sea Scroll community. What did the Dead Sea Scroll community prophesy about their Messiah? Well, that would be 4Q285. That would be the scroll found in cave four, number, document number 285. Well, 4Q285 talked about a Messiah who would kill the Roman emperor, kill all the Roman occupiers, vanquish a corrupt priesthood, and be a conquest Messiah. No one expected their Messiah to die on a Roman cross. It's really cool. I had the opportunity to write a 9,000-word article that's used in a textbook in our state schools right now, if you can believe this, on the philosophy of religion. It's called Case for Resurrection, and it's 9,000 words why our college students need to believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was accepted, praise God. It's in that, it's in that textbook that who knows if they'll read it, but it's there. Uh, but I make this point, and I think it's the reason it was accepted. There was no psychological motivation for the disciples to invent a fake resurrection narrative. They didn't need it. Uh, a lot more where that came from, I would encourage you to get uh, with the book. Um, we can evidence this also not just with the Dead Sea community, but within Jesus' own disciples' ranks. I think about Matthew chapter 16, 22, Peter, who occasionally speaks for Satan, apparently. There, so there's hope for you, by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus. Peter says, no, Lord, you can't go to the cross. And do you remember how Jesus responds to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. I'm not going to listen to that. Even Peter didn't understand it. That's why we do have communion or what we call the words of institution. The disciples had trouble grasping that Jesus had to go to the cross. Luke 9 says he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem to pay for our sin. Number five, written in archaeological sources, overwhelmingly, this is really cool, support the gospel's resurrection narrative. We all have friends who are skeptics, right? And like they're armchair critics, they believe in sound bites, not substance. They want to give you 60 seconds to state your case for the resurrection. Well, here's some cool factoids for our skeptical friends. And you might even be here today or listening online. I thank God for that. Um, when you look at the sources for Jesus within the first hundred years of his life, which is acceptable to any historian for any historical event, be it the Civil War or be it Jesus, we don't do any kind of religious trance when we look at Christian history. We treat it with the same historicity uh, that we study other events from late antiquity. It's fascinating to me we have 11 writers, 11 thinkers, 11 different pieces of evidences for the life of Jesus after his crucifixion for 100 years. In fact, I have to appeal to Roman emperors for the same level of evidence that we have for Jesus. Can you believe that? 
I mean, don't ever let that get lost on you. I mean, we only have two sources for Alexander the Great. No one questions that. They're 400 years later. We have an embarrassment of riches with Jesus of Nazareth, and we have the material culture, archaeology. Um, check out this really interesting photo that I want to show you, this calcified heel bone. A minute ago, I said that skeptics claim that, you know, if there's any way we can keep Jesus from getting to the tomb, there's no empty tomb tradition, therefore he didn't raise from the dead. So guess what? We're going to write best-selling books about how Jesus didn't know what he was doing, as I said. His body was thrown in a mass criminal pit, or his body was eaten by stray dogs. These are Bible scholars who make some of these claims. When we actually look at the material culture, this is really cool. That's a calcified heel bone of a crucified criminal named Yehohanan. That just means John. How do we know his name? We have his bone box. It says his name on the outside like most of them do. Burial had to happen before nightfall. There was a lot of superstition in first century Judaism. And guess what they did here? They said, well, it had fish hooked, and it turned, it knotted in the, in the heel bone, and they said, oh, go ahead and bury him. And what's fascinating about this is this shows us that even criminals were properly buried. So listen, friends, you can, if you're a skeptic, you can disagree with the theological implications. I mean, if you're a Muslim, and the Quran says in, in Surah 4, Ayah 156, that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that God made someone else look like him. That must have been a bad day for that person. Or if you, perhaps, you know, you might be an atheist and you don't believe in the supernatural, there must be some naturalistic explanation. You're free to disagree on theological grounds, but let me explain something to you. You are not free to disagree with the evidence for the resurrection on historical grounds. The evidence is that good. It's that powerful. Um, I want to show you the Emmaus tombs, if I may. Um, the Emmaus tombs, 80% of the tomb, uh, tombstone, the, excuse me, the tombs coverings, they would fit like a cork in a bottle. And they were about a meter square. But then if you go to the next slide, 20% of the tombs that we've uncovered in Israel are larger. Guess what? That meant you had more money in the bank. You were a wealthy person, so you had a more ornate, heavier tomb. What do we read when we open Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The women are going to the tomb. They're probably a little under five foot, four feet tall, maybe 100 pounds. They're rightly worried who will move that enormous stone of Joseph of Arimathea out of the way. And they get there and they're astonished. Jesus has been raised. It's powerful. And this is why I want to encourage you to get to know archaeology. Come to our Biblical Worldview Institute every year where we talk about these great things. And I do want to encourage you to go back to life groups. Uh, beginning April 14, and we already have a significant percentage of our church that attends life groups, but I'd be remiss not to mention beginning April 16 for four Sundays, as a church family, we're going through an apologetic series called Answers to Tough Questions, where we're going to be having these kinds of dialogues across, get this, all 200 life groups that meet not only on Sunday, but throughout the week of our church. So I would encourage you, that starts the Sunday after Easter. Now I want to get to my favorite point, number six. This is incredible. Number six, it is the only convincing explanation for the conversion of those who did not follow Jesus during his ministry. We can say that Jesus appeared to those who believed in him. Jesus also appeared to those who doubted him. And make no mistake, Jesus appeared to those who opposed him. The critics of Christianity have a real hard time explaining why this misanthropic man who didn't like all of humanity, who was a PhD in the Old Testament by the name of Saul of Tarsus, would have such a radical conversion and then author half of the New Testament. They have a real hard time explaining that without the resurrection. I want to talk about James for a moment because in our, in our text this morning, at verse 7, it says, then he appeared to James. Remember, Paul heard about that in Galatians chapter 1 when they met for 15 days in Jerusalem, okay? So, James did not believe his brother was the son of God. How many brothers do we have in the room? Raise your hand if you have a brother. I want to see. We've got a lot of brothers in the room. What would it take for you to believe your brother was the Messiah, the son of God for the whole world? Everyone always laughs when I ask that question. I have four boys. 
none of them are the Messiah, I assure you. We have to ask these kind of critical questions. James didn't believe his brother was the Messiah either. He was embarrassed by his brother. Look at these passages. Mark 3.21, he would have seen it that day when everyone wanted to kill Jesus. They took offense at him. In Nazareth, John 7 verse 5, not even his brothers believed on him. And then Mark 3, by the way, in case you were wondering, we also think he's out of his mind. It's hard to reach family, isn't it? It was also the case with Jesus. This is one of the reasons I love the Scriptures. It doesn't hide us from humanity. Jesus' own brother doubted him. And in a special resurrection appearance, remember the family trade was construction. And I could see James, oh, I'm humiliated by brother Jesus, killed on a Roman cross. It's going to hurt the family business. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. I can see it in my mind's eye in the construction shop. Bro, check it out, bro. Check out my sign. Check out my hands. They got me good. That's right. Touch it. See it. James, in that moment, because of the fact of the resurrection, goes from being a skeptic to being the pillar of the church in a moment. That's what evidence can do for us. So that's why Christianity is not faith in spite of evidence. It's faith in the evidence, and we need to know it. We know from Josephus, a first century historian, again, not in the Bible, James died. I asked if you would believe your brother was the Son of God. What would it take for you to die believing that? James is stoned to death in A.D. 62, believing his brother is the Son of God. What can account for the conversion of those who oppose Jesus if he wasn't resurrected? There's no reason for it. And then finally, and this is the beauty of where it gets really practical, number seven, why do I believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? It's the only convincing explanation for the historical fact, are you ready for this, that society is transformed everywhere Christianity is introduced and embraced. There's some really great thinkers that have talked about when you find a place where the gospel has gone, you're going to see that there is freedom, there's hope, there's less marginalization. Humanity is rehumanized, and that's what we need today. We need to take this message of resurrection to the world. How do we do that? We do it by an act of faith. We have to say, I do, to Jesus. I mentioned to you the gospel is always, that's God's part anyways, is the deity, death, and the resurrection. Our part is belief, trust in. But I feel like in our modern English, we lose sight of the fact that belief is like saying, I do, to Jesus. Now, what's really cool about it, like I remember this ring signifies so much for me, I met Audrey and when she was 17. I stole her number off the youth roster at beach camp that year. I don't recommend it. Well, actually, I do recommend it. It worked out pretty good. Um, we've been married 20 years. I did my research on Audrey before I married her, right? Before I said I do. Like, I checked it out, you know? And I wanted to marry her the next day after I met her. I, that was all the research I needed. So you can do research about saying I do to Jesus. You can check things out for yourself. But make no mistake, you have to come to a point where you say, I do with both feet, and I'm not looking back. I did that with my wife. I did that with Jesus. And friends, you need to do that today if you haven't. Today is the day of salvation. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 9, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is risen from the dead, you will be saved. 200 times in the New Testament, it's an act of faith. I would encourage you to make that decision today, wherever you're at. Let's bow our heads and pray for a time of decision. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to encourage you to not move around unnecessarily as the Holy Spirit's working in this moment. How many of you would say, Jeremiah, I need the hope of the resurrection today in a special way? I'm facing adversity. I'm facing challenges. I'm facing hopelessness. And would you just pray for me because I need the resurrection power that you're talking about. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead to flow in me. If that's you, just slip your hand up so I can pray for you to have hope, to leave here with hope today all over this room. Yes, yes, yes. Jeremiah, I need the hope of resurrection. Yes, sir, I see that. Yes, ma'am. 
see you in the balcony, yes. I need you to pray for me, Jeremiah, because I need hope, a living hope that's promised. Well, today, are you willing to say, I do? That's my question for you. Are you willing to jump in with both feet? Are you willing to not look back, and are you willing to commit your life to Jesus Christ? Perhaps you've already done that, but you've gotten away from the Lord. You need to rededicate today. Perhaps you've done that, but you're like Paul. You, you might have had an experience with God, but you need to come check out the church. It's time to join the local church. The greatest decision you can make as a parent or as a leader of your family or if you're a surrogate parent is to come into the life of our family to join Prestonwood Baptist Church, to get on mission with us, to get on mission with a gospel-centric, resurrection-centered church. We need you. More importantly, God loves you and he wants you. Thank you for joining us for worship at Prestonwood. As you heard earlier, if you made a decision for Christ, please text Jesus to 74788. We would love to connect with you and give you these great resources to help you grow in your faith. One is a New Believer's Bible with helpful notes to help you study God's Word. The other is a book by Pastor Jack Graham on the next steps to take as you pursue this new life in Christ. As we close, I'd like to thank you for your faithful giving to support Prestonwood and the work God is doing through our ministries. If you would like to give, text the word GIVE to 74788 or visit prestonwood.org give. It's been a joy worshiping with you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.